All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. How many of you showed up here to meet some reptiles this afternoon? Well, awesome. I'd like to thank you so much, folks. My name is Mark Perpetua. The name of this program is called Reptile Encounters, and I brought with me a few of some of my favorite creatures to introduce to you guys today. So first, let me say thank you for coming by. I got to tell you, when I was a kid and I first got interested in reptiles, not everybody around me got so excited thinking that there might be snakes and lizards and other animals around them. See, when I was a kid, people didn't know very much about reptiles. People thought they were scary or dangerous, but uh, hopefully after today, we'll get a better idea of what they're all about. There's also a lot more information available to us today, so check it out. You guys know there's snakes, you know there's lizards, you know there's other reptiles, and yet you guys said you were excited to meet them. So you have to remember, though, that reptiles come in a variety of different types. There are over 10,000 different types of reptiles alive today. And while some of them are cute and small and even became really popular as pets, there are reptiles in nature that get big, bite hard, and can even be venomous. So we're going to go over a little bit of all of that today. But we will. We'll start small. And um, I mentioned that some reptiles have become really popular as pets. And this is a great example. This is a lizard that's called a bearded dragon. Anybody out there happen to have a bearded dragon as a pet? Yeah, see, there we go. There's always at least one person. That's how popular they are. But we do have to remember that bearded dragons are a wild animal, and they don't just come from Petco and PetSmart. These guys here are native to Australia, and that's a part of the world that's really, really hot. The parts of Australia that they live in are easily 90 to 100 degrees at parts of the day. And you may have heard the fact that reptiles are cold-blooded. So living in a place that's really warm kind of sounds the opposite. But because reptiles can't generate their own heat from within, they need the warmth of that environment to stay happy and healthy and active. So yeah, cold-blooded reptiles don't really like New York winters very much. They don't like the AC in the summertime. And keeping an animal like a bearded dragon or any other cold-blooded reptile requires that they be heated. So he has a sun lamp at home. He has heat lamps, and those are the kinds of things that make sure that he thinks he's still in nature. And of course, that means he also has to eat. And well, there is no real good pet store type food for something like a bearded dragon. These guys, by the way, are omnivores, which means he eats a variety of little plants and little animals. And since he's not the biggest of lizards, little animals usually come in the form of spiders and insects. Mealworms are something you could buy in a pet store. Crickets are something you could buy in a pet store. And even cockroaches are now bred by people to feed to their pet lizards. Yeah, imagine bringing cockroaches home. But those are the kinds of things that a bearded dragon will snack on. Uh, as an omnivore, he does get little salads every now and then. Leafy greens in the wild, it would be leaves and flowers, maybe some berries. But yeah, at home, it's mostly Leafy greens with some chopped up, maybe yellow squash, some green beans, maybe a strawberry piece or two as a treat. And uh, well, one of the things I'll do since he's an omnivore when I make his salad is, well, how many of you like crunchy croutons? You know, he doesn't eat croutons, so he gets these big super worms. They're kind of crunchy, but they fill all of his needs. Now, the word bearded dragon, however, that's really interesting because that comes from his defense behavior. One of the reasons people might have been afraid of reptiles a long time ago is because reptiles, well, they're afraid of us. We're much bigger than many of them and they look at us as a possible predator and to keep themselves from being eaten, they have ways of making themselves look bigger and stronger. And that's why he's called a bearded dragon. Underneath his mouth or his neck down here, he's got a beard of spiky scales. And he's not really shown it off right now because he's super calm and really used to hanging out with people. But if you encountered a wild one or if maybe a cat or something he was afraid of ran up to him, he would open his mouth real fast, puff out his neck, and the skin between those scales turns dark black. And for a split second, that cat or other predator is going to go, what did I get myself into? He looks big, he looks bad, and I guess that's why they call them dragons. But as far as dragons go, 
bearded dragons certainly are not the biggest lizard. There are many lizards called dragons. Have you ever heard of the Komodo dragon? Yeah, yeah don't get excited. We don't have one of those. They simply get way too big. Komodo dragons are lizards that grow to about 300 pounds. That's a lizard that's nearly 12 feet long. So while I don't have a bearded, I mean, a Komodo dragon, I do have another large lizard. And um, this guy is a large lizard from South America who is not super friendly with people yet. Yeah, this is called the Argentine black and white tegu. He lives in a different part of the world. Argentina is in South America. His habitat is mostly forest habitat with much higher humidities. So yeah, he's kind of like a rainforest animal. And I hope nobody's offended right now because of that big tongue. Yeah, no, now he's gonna show us his big mouth. But yeah, look at that big tongue. Isn't that amazing? Lizards and snakes, like many animals, like to figure out what's around them by their great sense of smell. Except unlike most animals, lizards and snakes, they can't smell with their noses. So what he's doing right now is using his long forked tongue to pick the smells up out of the air. And when he pulls it back into his mouth, he's got an organ in the roof of his mouth called the Jacobson's organ. And that's how he's smelling you. Uh, and right now he's figured out there's some unusual things present. Unfortunately, this is a lizard who never got socialized when he was really young. And what I mean by that is all these reptiles that we work with and even the ones you see in pet shops, they still have their wild instincts. And if you don't let them know that you're their friend, they remain a little nervous and scared. Sure, he's used to me walking by the cage, he's used to it, loves it when I bring him food. But this guy right here is still getting used to being held. But he's getting better. When I first got him, he'd do this death roll like a crocodile to spin out of my hands. And see that big long tail? Yeah, have you ever been smacked by a big lizard's tail? It leaves a mark. He's come a long way. Sometimes when you pick up this tegu and he's scared or nervous, he'll smack you really hard with his tail. And that's his way of trying to get you to step back and leave him alone. But as you saw with his mouth open, if he gets really nervous and he feels he can't get away, tegus, like many animals, do bite. And it's unfortunate that sometimes we see these animals on YouTube, on social media, and somebody did a great job and their tegu sits in their lap like a pet cat. But then you get one and he turns out to have his mouth open and smacking you with his tail. So unfortunately they don't make the best pets for everybody and we forget that they still have that wild instinct. So obviously we know he's not super happy hanging out with people, but I'm assuming that nobody's got a mouse in their pocket right now either. Because if he smelt that, he'd probably behave a little different. One of the things he's doing with that tongue is looking for food. And because other animals see a tegu coming, they know to get out of the way and hide. So often a tegu will find food by smelling it before it sees it. So this little guy right here, if he smelt something in the room like a mouse, he would of course want to go find it for dinner. And that makes feeding time with many of these larger reptiles really interesting. You see at home, if you're gonna feed them, they do have to have food that's very similar to what they might eat out in the wild. And he's a larger lizard, so while he will eat bugs, keep in mind where he lives, the roaches are eight inches long, he still will eat a variety of other things. Small lizards, small snakes, lots of birds, lots of eggs, and of course, small rodents. So the easiest thing for a reptile keeper to get for his large carnivores are what I like to call mice sickles. I have a freezer full of frozen mice, frozen rodents of various sizes, but remember the fact that he's cold-blooded? He can't have his mice frozen. He'll get a really bad brain freeze. So what I do is I prepare ahead of time. I'll have a bucket full of mice and rodents thawing out overnight, but I gotta remember how good his sense of smell is. By the next morning, the aroma of mouse has filled the air, and he's on the hunt. He's not this nervous little lizard that seems relaxed right now. Instead, he turns into a little mini velociraptor on the prowl looking for food. And that means if your finger's in the wrong place, in nature, food doesn't come from the freezer. They bite first and they ask questions later. So that's one of the things you gotta remember 
if you're working with a larger lizard. But yeah, I still have all my fingers, I still have all my toes, and, and life's been going pretty good so far. So this guy's come a long way since I got him. And that's a good thing, because although he's never gonna get as big as a Komodo dragon, black and white tegus can grow to almost five feet long. And sometimes people just don't know what to do with him. If somebody just let him go around here, he would never make it. In South America, this type of lizard doesn't know what winter is and doesn't know how to hibernate like our native reptiles, and it would freeze or die. Places like Florida, however, are becoming overrun with exotic species. And you know, we could cruise through the suburbs and watch squirrels. You can go through the suburbs of Miami and see tegus and iguanas running down the sidewalk. So that's why I work very closely with my good friend Brian. Some of you might have met him out there today. He runs what is called the Hudson Valley Reptile and Rescue. So if you find yourself a little over your head, we have organizations that are able to take them in and find them proper homes. And that's uh, one of the way I come across a lot of my reptiles as well. So, so thank you, Brian. All right, let's go ahead and put our tegu back. Now, working with exotic reptiles has always been one of my biggest goals, and I'm glad I get to do that now. But I also remember when I was a kid, that some of the most amazing reptiles I saw were very close to home. And what I mean by that is going right down to the local creeks and ponds, watching things like snakes and turtles, but always being warned about, well, something we know as snapping turtles. This is a common snapper, and it's our largest turtle here in the Northeast. These guys are called common snappers because they're commonly seen. They are found from Canada to Mexico and from the Atlantic coast all the way over to the Rocky Mountains. They do have a bigger cousin that lives in the south known as the alligator snapper, which does not live this far north. But our common snappers can and do get much bigger than even this guy. This guy, I gotta tell you a little story about him though too. He's sort of a, a different type of a rescue. He wasn't somebody's pet that needed a home. This was a turtle that found himself in a position that wasn't really good for him. You see, last summer, last spring, I don't know if you remember, we had a really wet spring, a lot of rain. And snapping turtles don't always stay in one pond. They'll go exploring and look for new environments, new sources of food, and when it's wet out, they may go further than they should. In fact, we believe this guy ended up in a drainage ditch on the side of a busy road just a little bit north of here. The reason is because one morning, my daughter went to work. My daughter works at one of my favorite drive-in ice cream shops in Kingston. And I got a phone call. Dad, if you're not busy, do you want to come and get the big snapping turtle out of the parking lot? Yeah, he had wandered into the parking lot. That was a really good day for both of us, I hope. He was dehydrated, he needed some water. I got a free milkshake and a new turtle here to introduce to you guys. Now, when I first met him, he wasn't super happy. He didn't know what was gonna happen. And if you look at the bottom part of a snapper, you'll notice that the belly is really thin and narrow. When a snapper is found in a position in the roadway, in a parking lot, your driveway, they're not super fast runners. And you'll notice he wasn't very nervous until I flipped him up. The whole time I took him out, he seemed okay, but once I flipped him up, that's when they get nervous. Their shell can't protect them, and their neck doesn't bend in a way that will allow him to bite anything that's below him. So if he gets flipped on his back, he's in a really dangerous position. So snappers don't wait till you get close. They can rear up a little bit on their back legs, they open their mouth, and when they strike, sometimes they strike so hard, it moves their whole body. It looks like they're jumping, but they're not. They're just biting that hard. But if you stay out of his face, I promise you, he'll stay out of yours. When they're in the water, completely different animals. Water is their environment. They're much better swimmers than they are runners, and even though they don't trust their shell, they get down at the bottom, they burrow in the weeds and the mud, and you just don't hear about snapping turtle attacks because they recognize that we're something they should hide from. So in the water, don't be afraid of ponds and lakes. Go kayaking, go swimming, go fishing. But if you see one crossing the road, just remember, stay away from the front end. They have long necks, they strike as fast as snakes, and obviously, as their name implies, they give some pretty hard bites. They don't have teeth, but they got a really sharply curved beak that makes them give 
a very hard bite. So not an animal to be afraid of, but definitely an animal that deserves respect. He too is an omnivore. I know a lot of people uh, think they only eat meat, but they will eat plants. And, and on his excursion, he was eating a lot of grasses. I know that because, well, when I got him settled into his new big, big enclosure, he ended up going to the bathroom and most of it seemed to be grassy remains. All right, let's go ahead and get him back in there. Now, one of the hardest biters in the animal kingdom, of course, are a group of animals we call the crocodilians. And unfortunately, I was unable to bring an alligator with me today because there wasn't enough room in the truck. But uh, we normally have one on our displays. Today out there, we have this beautiful alligator skull. And it'll give you an idea of just why they're such powerful biters. Thick, heavy, bony heads surrounded by muscle and an alligator the size of that skull that that skull came from, which was nearly 10 feet long, would eat a snapping turtle crushing through its shell like we just showed you as easily as you might bite into an apple. So 3,000 pounds of pressure from an alligator's jaw. But one of the animals that definitely causes the most amount of fears are still snakes. I mean, it's easy to recognize that a 10-foot alligator with huge teeth and jaws bite hard. Stay away. But one of the reasons people are afraid of snakes is because even some of the smaller ones could potentially be venomous. There are over 6,000 different snakes in the world, but only about 450 or so are medically dangerous to humans. I say it that way because some snakes have other types of venoms that might help them eat certain foods like fish and frogs and never affect a human. But we do know that rattlesnakes, cobras, mamba, some of the world's most famous venomous snakes could be potentially dangerous. So when some people see a snake, they don't know what kind it is. One of the first things that comes to mind, what if it's venomous? Well, guess what? Just like the snapping turtle, you don't know what it is, don't pick it up. Uh, a lot of our old field guides from the old scouting days when I was young would tell you about the shape of the pupil of their eye. Well, is it smart to get close enough to see the shape of a snake's pupil of its eye without knowing whether or not it's venomous or not? I go by, I go by color of skin and pattern and, of course, knowing where they live so you know you're not going to run into a king cobra in the Catskill Mountains but you might run into a timber rattlesnake. Timber rattlesnakes luckily come with a rattle that makes noise. And that's not the rattlesnakes cry to an attack. Rattlesnakes shake their tail, so if you don't see them, you hear them and know to walk the other way. They're giving you a chance to leave them alone. Nobody's ever been chased by a rattlesnake through the woods. This guy, by the way, is not a venomous snake. I wouldn't be holding him like this. This is a harmless snake in terms of no venom called a gopher snake. And you may not have ever heard of one. Gopher snakes don't live on this side of our country. They live on the other side. They're native to the US and Mexico, and they live on the West Coast primarily. I believe this particular little guy is the variety that would be found in, in Southern California, San Diego, into Mexico, Baja Peninsula. But they get their name gopher snake because they're one of our biggest. These guys are gonna grow to be nearly seven feet long and they inhabit gopher burrows. Yeah, a lot of people think snakes burrow with their nose. You get a really bad headache doing that too. So he utilizes the burrows that a gopher would dig. And as he gets near seven feet long, it's definitely a win-win because some of those gophers are going to become dinner. Yeah, he's not venomous, but he is a constrictor. He wraps and squeezes and uses constriction as a way of choking his prey to swallow it safely. But let's imagine as a cold-blooded animal on a cool morning, he's outside the gopher burrow getting some sun to warm up. And then all of a sudden, a hiker, a mountain biker approaches him and startles him. Well, the snake's got two choices. Get back down that burrow, but if he thinks he doesn't have time, he doesn't want to stick his head in some place while you grab his tail and hurt him. So sometimes the snakes will stand their ground. And just like that bearded dragon, they'll put on a big show to make themselves look scarier. What a gopher snake does is really amazing. These guys 
curl up, hold their head up high, and they shake their tail back and forth. There's no rattle, but it gives the appearance of something that might have one. And since his tail doesn't make noise, he'll hiss at you. And when a gopher snake hisses, it has a special flap of skin in front of its throat. So instead of that nice clear hiss that we think most snakes make, there's vibrates. So you know what that sounds and looks like to many other animals, including people? He looks like a rattler. Yeah, he's got these big defenses trying to scare you back, but again, check him out. He's not gonna use his defenses as amazing as they are to see in person because he's already learned that I'm not a threat. And it's important to understand that even a venomous snake like a rattler or one of our most infamous venomous snakes, the copperheads, I say infamous not because they're our most dangerous, they really aren't, but everybody thinks a snake when they see one is a copperhead if they don't know what it is. But these snakes, they really want nothing to do with us. If they look big and scary, it's because they feel cornered. You back away, they back away. And being able to work with them in captivity just shows that once they learn to trust you, you learn to trust them and they drop their attitude. Now even though he's going to get quite large, when I speak of constrictors, we often think of snakes that get even bigger. So there's a group of snakes we often call the giant snakes, and they're made up of two different families. One is the python family, and some pythons really are giants. The longest, the longest snake in the world is the reticulated python, measuring over 25 feet on average with a world record of 35, two, 32 feet 10 inches. But then the other side of the giant snake family is the boa family. And uh, while I don't have a 25 foot snake, I do have a young boa constrictor to show you guys. This is often referred to as a common boa. Common boas are native to Mexico, Central, and maybe the very northern parts of South America. And this is a young male. He was another one that was surrendered, who didn't have, uh, somebody just didn't have a lot of time for him. But this snake is still growing. Common boas can grow up to about eight feet in length, which sounds pretty big, but there are bigger. The closest relative to the common boa is the red tail boa. They might truly reach, somebody wants to put on his own show. So. Red-tailed boas might go as big as 12 feet long, but even a big boa between eight to 12 feet is only gonna weigh somewhere between 40 to 50 pounds at max. This guy, he's probably only about five pounds right now, so he's still got some growing to do. But the boa side of the family still has some big members as well. The biggest member of the boa family and the heaviest snake in the world is the green anaconda. Imagine trying to drag a snake to shows that weighed almost 300 pounds. Now you know why we got the little boa. Much easier to handle. But you can also tell that he's bigger bodied, bigger head. This is a snake that can eat bigger prey. All snakes are capable of eating things much bigger than their own head. So as little as his head looks right now though, this is an animal that's graduated well past those frozen mice sickles I mentioned. Yeah, he's moved on to what we call jumbo rat sickles. And full grown boas can eat things the size of whole chickens. And as I mentioned, they're powerful squeezers. They like to give their food a little hug before they swallow it. It's just not a friendly hug. And that's important, because you'll notice snakes don't have arms, they don't have legs, and their teeth are sharp for catching prey, but not good for chewing. So these snakes have to be able to kill their prey in order to swallow it safely so they don't get injured along the way. But hopefully what we got today was a better understanding of what, what many of these reptiles are all about. Some are big, some are venomous, they deserve respect, but obviously America, I mean, humans have taken over the world. The reptiles aren't out there trying to do us in, and there's no reason to be as scared of them as people have been for many generations beforehand. So if you didn't have a chance, a little earlier, Brian and I were out front. We got a beautiful tortoise from Africa, completely calm, not like a snapper. You can pet it. Brian had a uh, beautiful albino corn snake. And what I'm going to do is just come stand to the other side of the stage 
And if you'd like an opportunity to get a closer look at the boa and see what it feels like, we'll stick around for a little bit, answer some questions, and let you touch the snakes again. All right? All right, looks like the rain stopped too. Hopefully we get some more of that great maple syrup, folks. Thank you so much for coming out today. Hope you enjoyed meeting the reptiles. I also forgot to mention, because it's still relatively new in my head, but together Brian and I put out a educational series of reptile videos. Some longer, some more complicated to listen to, but some short and fun just like the show. Please check us out, Talking Reptiles on YouTube.